Welcome to another Humanities Montana, Montana Conversation. I'm so happy to have our Executive Director, Randy Tanglin, here today to talk about the secret history of Montana women's cookbooks. Randy? Well, thank you, Sam. I am just so happy to be able to share my research on women's church and community cookbooks today, especially because there's been such a renewed interest in baking and cooking while so many of us were stuck at home during COVID. And especially right now, during the holidays, many of us might be reaching for a well-worn cookbook from our family's cookbook collection. And um, I started this research about 20 years ago, actually, when I was choosing a topic for my master's thesis in English at the University of Montana. I knew I wanted to write about portrayals in literature of Western pioneering women on the prairies and plains. And this is a region typically associated in literature with women's isolation and loneliness and hysteria. Um, the reason I was interested in this was because I'm a product of that part of the world, of the plains and the prairies of eastern Montana. I was born in Sydney, where my father and his family are from, and my mother and her family come from the Luster area. So when I looked into the literature initially, I found stories that didn't initially ring true to me, and if anything, had really negative portrayals of women and their experiences. And I think certainly there's something to be said for these stories of isolation and loneliness of settler women in the homesteading era. But that couldn't be the only story. That's what uh, Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie calls the danger of a single story. And I wanted to know, were there other stories of Eastern Montana women and where would I find those stories recorded? So that summer when I was thinking about my, my thesis topic, I was uh, at my parents' house and I was helping my mother prepare a feast for a gathering of some of our family. And we were preparing dishes, dishes from my mother's Russian Mennonite heritage. And I was looking for a recipe for one of those dishes. So I went to my mom's cookbook cupboard and I pulled out this cookbook, What's Cooking in Luster? And so growing up, I'd heard about my family's Mennonite heritage and I was really interested in, in it. My siblings and I weren't raised in that tradition, but we were certainly aware of our Mennonite culture through food and primarily food that my mother and her aunts prepared, foods like brenica, kind of like a pierogi, roll kuchen, a fried pastry, or in pasca, a, a rich Easter bread. Um, so opening the, the, this cookbook to it, its first page, I saw a list of the women who worked together on a church committee to create this cookbook back in 1968. They would go on to create multiple editions of this book and further volumes of the, cook, the, the Luster cookbook, three volumes in total. And uh, when I looked into it, I found that these were the women of the Mission Society of the Evangelical Mennonite Brethren Church in Luster. And I think everyone is probably familiar in some sense with these community cookbooks. Women from the community would submit their recipes and then put their names next to their, their recipes. Um, and this book, and so this indicated that dozens of women in the community uh, submitted their recipes for these cookbooks. And this one particularly, the, the What's Cooking in Luster, revised number one. Um, this was a, a cookbook I knew well. My mother had had it in her collection for years. And, and my copy is a newer copy. But my, my mother's copy is, um, it's worn, it's tattered. The cover is tattered around the edges. The, pen, the pages themselves are filled with um, my notes in pencil and my mother's handwriting. Um, adjusting recipes or making her comments about the recipes or marking when she had prepared them. Um, and the spatters of sauces and batters on the pages of the cookbook told stories about my mother and our family. It recorded memories. It documented where we'd come from, where we'd been. It brought back recollections of family gatherings and food associated with those, with those events. And when I started looking into it, I found that many white immigrant settler communities in Eastern Montana had so many of these locally produced cookbooks through women's organizations, civic organizations, church organizations, and that they really do tell the story of individual women 
and of their communities. And uh, a lot of these cookbooks have really uh, pithy poems and expressions recorded in them as well. And actually one of those poems from this 1968 edition of What's Cooking in Leicester really explains why I was interested in women's community cookbooks as literature for the stories they could tell. The poem uh, reads, I need someone to pick me up and look inside my cover. And if you do, I promise you a new world you will discover. And I wanted to discover that new world. So uh, at that time, this is around 2002, 2003, I applied for a research grant from what was then Montana Committee for the Humanities, now Humanities Montana, to research the historical, literary, and cultural significance of women's community cookbooks in Eastern Montana. So I toured the state looking at what I called cookbook archives in uh, museums and libraries and communities uh, such as Billings, Glendive, Miles City. I also visited Huntley Project and Forsyth. But these luster cookbooks from my mom's, uh, from where my mom grew up, those were, were my primary case study. And I also did some uh, in-depth interviews with women who were involved with that, that cookbook committee. So over the years, people have asked me, why am I interested in cookbooks from a scholarly perspective? What does, what does it mean to look at women's community cookbooks through a humanities lens? And my response is that I'm not necessarily interested in the cookbooks for the recipes that are in them, although that's very fascinating too. And I've even tried some of those recipes over the years. And I'm not ne necessarily interested in the cookbooks for their utilitarian purpose, but for their expressive and meaning making potential. And so with that perspective in mind, I came to three major conclusions about women's cookbooks in Eastern Montana. The first one is that cookbooks were a way for Eastern Montana women to write themselves into the narrative of local and regional history. My second conclusion was that cookbooks as literature can be read as Montana women's life writing. And my third conclusion was that church and community cookbooks are an unexpected outlet for female leadership and influence in Montana communities. So today I'm just going to kind of talk through that, my first conclusion and show you a couple exam of examples from the cookbooks. Um, and so my first conclusion is, was that the community cookbooks were a way for women to write themselves into the narrative of local and regional history. Any Hamilton fans out there, you remember that Eliza saying that she was going to write herself into the narrative. That is, she was going to tell her own story on her own terms. And that's because women don't usually show up in the narrative. They don't usually show up in the historical official record, church records, military records, government records, unless they were women who were associated with famous or powerful men. And even then there's no guarantee that these women show up in the historical record or the narrative. And for some time now, scholars of women's history have learned to look to other sources for evidence of, of women's life and women's history. And cookbooks are one of those sources. They're opportunities for women to write themselves and their communities into being. A lot of times uh, women's work, the work that women do in the, the private domestic sphere of home and family, it's work that's undervalued because it's invisible. So cooking and cleaning, caring for children, this is work that's not seen and it's work that's done to be undone. So cookbooks make women's work and identities concrete and visible or part of the narrative. And I'm not saying that that was necessarily the goal of women who made cookbooks together, but it was really a very happy, fortunate outcome of that. And so I like this first example the cover of the St. Margaret's Guild cookbook. You'll see that it has the signatures of the women who contributed their recipes as members of the Guild. And this cookbook comes from Miles City. So these women were literally writing themselves and their names into the narrative. Women also write each other into the narrative. We see a network of female relatives and friends in each cookbook. And uh, this cookbook from the Range Riders Auxiliary in Miles City, Grandma's Favorite Recipes. 
Uh, this cookbook came out, I think, in around 1974. And each page of this cookbook, and this is just an example. I think many cookbooks do this, but this was a great example. Each page records female kinship relations between, between women through this vessel of recipes and, and shared domestic culture. It's kind of like a matrilineal culinary family tree. So for example, on one page, we see that Doris Tackett submitted great grandma Essie Northcutt's chili recipe and that Zola Stone submitted her mother Anna Thede's recipe for apple glaze lamb chops. And on the next page, Anna Thede's granddaughter then, Mary Lab, submitted her grandmother's recipe for do ahead buffet dinner. There's also a recipe for chicken pot pie that's just attributed to great grandmother Penner. Everyone knew who she was. And also a recipe for smothered beef steak is attributed to mother of Mrs. Alice Hagem by Mrs. George Emick. So I, I saw women doing even more than writing themselves and writing other women into the narrative. They were really preserving the memory of their communities in these cookbooks. Uh, one woman, Carolyn Fouth of Glasgow, described how the cover of a cookbook that she and nine other women made for the Baylor Home uh, Demonstration Club in 1963. Um, Baylor at that time was a dying community and it had already lost its post office and its, its school. And so Carolyn describes um, on the first, on, on the inside cover, we drew our brands and the brands of anyone else who lived in the area. And I saw this in several cookbooks. She goes on and says, on the first page, we put the name of the book, the club name and where we were located and also the year. The next page we put the map of Montana and where Baylor was on the map. There's another example, the, the third volume of what's cooking in Luster. You see the Montana map and you see that Luster is marked there on the map. And this was also drawn by Carolyn Fouth who created the Baylor cookbook cover. Um, Amanda Wall, who was the head of that cookbook com com uh, committee for many years, she says that really the best thing that came of the cookbook project was that due to sales ranging from California to the East Coast over a period of 35 years, their cookbook moved just beyond their church and community and that quote, people know about us. So there really is a, a really significant impact then in the way that cookbooks allow women to write themselves and their communities into the narrative. Uh, when I concluded this research back in 2003, I compiled it and I gave several presentations all over Eastern Montana. I went to Glasgow, Miles City, Billings, a few other communities, and the audiences were primarily composed of women, but I was pleasantly surprised by the men who were also interested in, in this topic. And what I didn't expect from audience questions and comments was that um, what I noticed was they weren't just rethinking cookbooks and uh, what cookbooks could mean, how cookbooks have an expressive potential, but they were really rethinking the significance of the lives and work of their female family members, their mothers, grandmothers, great grandmothers, and aunts. And, and that really struck me because that's precisely what the humanity should do. They should help us see our lives and our, our world and our histories in and, and a new way. Um, so I hope Everyone will keep this in mind this holiday season um, that you can see your lives and your history and your family's life in a new way when you are searching for exciting and fun recipes and looking at your family's uh, cookbook collection. Thank you so much. That's fascinating. And I'm going to go dig out my cookbooks and see what notes are in there and splatter some sauce on some stuff. <laughs> Write yourself into the narrative. Yeah. <laughs> and we'd love, of course, to see um, any anyone who's watching this and has photos of family cookbooks or stories that they want to tell, please send them to us. We love to collect these um, experiences from everyone across Montana. Thank you so much, Randy. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you.